Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Betting Life Podcast brought to you by Fantasy Life. I'm powered by our friends at Unabated. I'm Matthew Friedman, Matt F. The Oracle. Peter Jennings is on by this week. So joining me to talk Thursday night football as well as the week's line moves, key numbers, potential teasers, and maybe a favorite bet for week 15 is a former colleague of mine from FTN, Chris Meany. Chris, how's it going? It's doing, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Um, we were talking a little bit in the green room before we got going here. It's been a wild NFL season. It's been pretty fun, though, at the same time. There's only two teams eliminated, Freeman. Like, we're here into week 15, and there are a ton of teams in the NFC that are sitting at 6 and 7. There's a few teams inside the AFC sitting at 7 and 6. It's going to be a fun race here down the stretch, and it's just been a, it's been a wild campaign, and I know you're all over – totals and I, I we've seen a lot of totals in the low 30s so it's been a wild year man uh thanks for having me it should be fun, a lot of fun here yeah it's it's always great talking with you uh and we have seen a lot of low totals this year and it continues uh it just absolutely continues because on thursday night football we have a disgusting matchup uh an afc west matchup of easton stick going on the road to play maybe aiden o'connell Maybe it will be Jimmy G, but Chargers on the road playing the Raiders uh, in the look ahead market. The Chargers were, of course, favored. Uh, Justin Herbert suffers a finger injury and he's out. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have Easton Stick coming in. And so the Raiders favored by three, a 34 point total. Uh, Meanie, is there anything that you see in this game that might attract you? Not really, honestly. I, I'm waiting to hear about Josh Jacobs. If Josh Jacobs doesn't suit up, I may get involved with like a prop that has to do with Zamir White potentially, but uh, it does seem a little risky at the moment. You know, it could be a little bit of Amir Abdullah there. I know that was more of a, a New England Patriot thing. Um, you know, and, and Josh bringing over his former guy in Amir Abdullah. Uh, he, I know he had spent some time with him before um, back in the day, but I, I think, you know, this is going to be a hard game to try to find some offense from because you got Staley, who just seems like it's one foot out the door, maybe a foot and a half out the door at this point. It seems like he's lost the locker room. You know, talk last week about Austin Eckler and maybe getting some other running backs involved. We saw Isaiah Spiller get involved. And you got Joshua Kelly there, and now you're going to stick. And then, as you mentioned, the Raiders are not even telling anybody who they're starting at the quarterback position. So uh, I know it's a very low number. But this Chargers team, like the past couple of weeks, seven points, six points, 10 points, it's 23 points. You just saw the Raiders get shut out at home. Um, or like, this is, this is not, uh, it's not ideal. <laughs> Three points, sorry, excuse me, last week for the Raiders. It's not ideal for, for either offense. So lean to the under. I'll be taking a look at rushing attempts uh, if there is no Josh Jacobs. And I will say this, Eckler's totals are really low. I know you've been following some props for quite some time. I mean, he hasn't top 67 rushing yards since week one, but he's still getting involved through the air. I'm seeing right now a rushing attempt prop for him at 12 and a half over at Fanduel at minus 114. It's kind of interesting to me. And the 46 and a half rushing yards, fairly, fairly low. I would have, I would imagine they try to make life a little simple here for uh, their young quarterback and lean on the run game. But it's just, it's, it's two coaches in particular, Staley, that it's just really hard to trust at the moment. All right. So by the way, I just got to mention, there's like a light situation that has like popped up on multiple shows. Now the producers have to hate me because, uh, every, every show they're like, all right, get some cardboard, like prop it up, uh, to sort of like block out the light that's coming in from your window. And I do it. And there's always like this little sliver that's open. And if it's overcast, then there is no light coming through. If it's not overcast, then there's like this ray that just gets beamed like straight into my face. And it's like coming and going as we are recording the show right now. Uh, and so anyway, if, if you're watching I thought you were talking this, about Zamir White. That is, I was like, I thought it, that is what's happening. Thing happening on the show. I was like, ah, is Zamir White or is this the, the glare on no. your face? But yeah, it's just, it's, it's just the glare, White. the glare that's concentrated straightly on my face right now. Uh, you mentioned the under here. And I mean, I just got to say, like, we all know, like, what has happened with unders this year, where it's just kind of ridiculous, the the totals that we've seen. But in the off season, you know, different sports books would post, you know, far in advance, look ahead numbers for games. In the off season, this number was 47. <laughs> in, the, wow. in the look ahead market, this number was 42 and a half. And then, of course, uh, you know, injury to Justin Herbert, 
uh, more confirmation of the Raiders under Antonio Pierce is just being a dead under team. Uh, they are five and one to the under with Pierce as their head coach. Uh, 34 and a half is the the number that we saw when this line opened. Uh, lucky me, I, I bet this on the look ahead. So I, I have a, the under at 42 and a half. Uh, and I'm nice. thinking about maybe grabbing the over at 34 and a half and seeing if I can get uh, a sweet, sweet middle at the same time. I might just kind of let this ride because I still am projected a little bit to the under here. I have this projected at 33.3. So I'll probably just hold the position, but I think this is going to be a nasty game uh, just in terms of points scored. And I think that will kind of flow into the prop market. Uh, and so uh, a number of unders one, uh, I will say this is disgusting because I don't indulge in kicker props that often. But one that <laughs> does kind of interest me is the idea that if this is a really disgusting, low scoring game, that we actually might see uh, a little more kicking. Um, and uh, the Chargers, uh, Cameron Dicker is actually a pretty good kicker. Like, I think it's kind of underappreciated, but he has like a career mark of like 95% for conversions. Like he's missed only one kick all year. I think last year he missed only one kick, but 95% conversion rate on his field goals. Uh, and he hasn't missed ever, uh, an extra point in the NFL. So like he is a low key kind of under the radar, really good kicker. Uh, and then the Raiders are allowing two field goal attempts per game. So like on average. So I think if we see the Raiders, uh, get two attempts here, Pretty good chance that Digger converts both of them and he goes over the one and a half mark of field goals. So I am interested in him if people want to get like really exotic off the board with their props. That one does catch my eye here. All right. So that is that's enough Thursday night football talk. Uh, I mean, I don't know if people like I kind of joke about like, hey, maybe I don't watch this game. Um, but, you know, seriously, there are. There are some games to where it's maybe better not to spend that three hours live watching it. And if you want to get it like in the condensed form the next day, do that. You know, like if you want to be the completist who actually does watch every game, but you know, maybe spend some time doing something else. You're probably not going to regret not spending the three hours watching this game live. That's that's maybe it'll surprise you. Personal new, opinion. New maybe. New England and Pittsburgh surprised some people. I think the last Thursday night football game was was kind of surprising. But I like the kicker props. I mean, I'll even throw Daniel Carlson. I mean, uh, Dicker the kicker at minus 115 there over FanDuel for the two field goals. And you would imagine both offenses, especially the Chargers, they struggle if they get inside the red zone. So I really like that call. And even Daniel Carlson, who hasn't been as consistent as the past, in the past couple of years, I mean, he's been one of the better kickers, actually. Uh, minus 130 for over one and a half field goals as well. It's going to be tough. Tough, especially if you're, you know, in your fantasy football semifinal matchup and you have, you know, Keenan Allen or Devontae Adams, you're just hoping that these guys can, you know, catch some of the targets that may come their way. <laughs> but yeah, maybe, maybe this is one that you want to watch uh, under the two hours on, on Friday afternoon. Yeah, I have a theory about this. I maybe in the offseason we'll kind of dig into it. Like low total games that don't have any weather conditions like this, you know, indoors in Las Vegas versus the low total games that do have weather conditions uh, and how that might impact what we see out of kickers. My theory is that the low total games, we actually see a little more out of the kickers and then the low total games with wind or, you know, whatever elements are going on, uh, you know, weather conditions driving the game total down, then that could be be obviously like a serious impact against the kickers but uh yeah so little little theory there but uh, that is one reason why i'm on the kicking props in this game all right moving into the main slate for week 15 uh, i want to talk about the line moves that have my attention now chris if there are other games that uh i don't call out here feel free to bring them up but uh a number of games driven primarily by uh injuries to quarterbacks uh a number of lines that have moved here so starting with minnesota at cincinnati in the look ahead market this was uh the vikings favored by one uh now the vikings four point three and a half point underdogs uh you know 
obviously some of this is, you know, quarterback situation, a quarterback change, injuries to Justin Jefferson, uncertainty if he's playing. Uh, and then we just have continued to see Cincinnati look really good on offense. You also have the Bears at Cleveland. Uh, this was the Bears, you know, two and a half point underdogs in the look ahead market. It opened at three. It's now moved to three and a half. So moving through the key number of three, pretty significant jets at dolphins. I will just say I grabbed the, uh, the number here at the exact wrong time. Uh, the dolphins minus 13 and the look ahead 13 and a half at some places. This opened at 12 before Monday night football. Uh, the dolphins obviously lost on Monday night football. And this number is now at eight and a half favoring the dolphins, the Texans, uh, on the road at Tennessee injury with CJ Stroud, uh, move this from Houston favored by three and a half, four on the look ahead to Tennessee favored by two before Monday night football, Tennessee wins Monday night football, Tennessee now favored by two and a half. Uh, the look ahead for the total has also moved down, uh, 42 and a half, 43 was the number on look ahead. Uh, it is now around 38, uh, the chiefs at the Patriots on the look ahead. This was chiefs favored by 10, 10 and a half. Uh, of course they lose at home to the bills and this number is now at nine and a half. And then you have Washington on the road playing the Rams, uh, for the total the look ahead. This was 46, 46 and a half. It opened at 48 and a half and is now at 49 and a half. And then the Ravens at Jacksonville for the total, the look ahead was 40. It opened at 43 and a half, which is where it is now. So some upward movement that we've seen recently uh, for some of these totals in a year where uh, totals have, you know, inclined towards the under anything there that I just hit on catch your eye. I think the Cincinnati and, and Minnesota one, I mean, the look ahead, you mentioned minus one there and then the open plus four and then three and a half here. Uh, I've really been impressed with Jake Browning. I know that the Bengals defense hasn't been great this season. They've been among the leaders in yards allowed per attempt and yards allowed per carry. And the Vikings defense actually has been pretty solid over the past several weeks. It's not like last year where, you know, this offense had to score 40 points. I mean, they just had to score four points last week to win the football game uh, and they weren't able to do it. But I really like what I've seen from Jake Browning. I mean, he's got a 75 percent completion rate, 9.1 yards per attempt. He's got five passing touchdowns to the the two picks he's got two rushing touchdowns he's very athletic and you mentioned justin jefferson they could be without alexander madison they they're not getting anything really on the ground anyways whether madison is playing or not ty chandler doesn't like i like ty chandler as a player catch a few passes out of the backfield he's explosive with the ball in his hands but he's not a guy that oh we're just going to give him 15 carries on this Bengals defense that's been you know, mediocre against the run and he's going to be okay. I, I think that there's some significant issues happening at the moment in Minnesota and going to Nick Mullins uh, is uh, maybe a slight downgrade, maybe a sideways move from Joshua Dobbs, but it's, it's still not Kirk Cousins and Jake Browning on the other side is playing really good football. So that one's interesting to me. And then the, the jump in the total a little bit in the Washington and the Rams game, I can get into that a little bit more, but I really like uh, what I've seen from LA. Over the past couple of weeks, they've moved inside the top 10 in, in DVOA, past DVOA offense. And uh, I don't know about you, but I, I counted Matthew Stafford and this Rams uh, offense out last week in Baltimore. I I know that Stafford had a couple good games before that. But for him to, to play this Baltimore team, I think heading into last week, it was fewer than five yards per attempt. It was a, an historic defense. It, it almost looked like the 2000 Baltimore Ravens, but uh, Stafford went in there and, and had 394 yards and three uh, passing touchdowns. He's got 10 over his last three games. So those are a couple that it really caught my eye. And I think maybe slight overreaction with the Chiefs, although you and I chatted before we got on here, uh, this isn't the same Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I'm not talking about him complaining and crying after tough losses. Uh, this offense has not been good, right? This is before in the past. They've had to score 30 plus points to win football games. The defense has been good for the most part, uh, but they lead the the NFL in drops. You know, Kadarius Tony lining up offside, dropping passes, Watson dropping passes, Sky Moore, everybody inside this offense dropping passes. And and also Travis Kelsey doesn't look 100 percent to me. He's not getting that separation. He's getting doubled. They're taking him away. Uh, but at the end of the day, New England can't really score any points. So we get the what, 10 and a half, I think you said to, to nine and a half. You know, maybe slight overreaction. I still think that they win the football game by 10 points. You know, the, the Patriots, like, I don't really want to be betting on them in the spot. I am showing some value 
there, however. But the thing is, like, this number was 10 and a half in the look ahead market. Like, that was the time to bet it. You know, like, if you right. like the Patriots, getting them above the 10, I think, was pretty important. Um, because, you know, like, I have this projected at eight and a half. There's really no difference between eight and a half and nine and a half. And nine and a half, it's just, you know, it's obviously so close to 10, you know, uh, and 10 being a, a key number here. Uh, it's just, you know, I don't think you could be betting on the Patriots at this spot, even though the line has moved towards them. And that would, you know, in theory, be a, a bullish indicator there. Um, the Vikings, that game is really interesting. Like the Bengals are uh, very healthy right now. And you have all this injury uncertainty with the Vikings. And uh, I have, uh, you know, sort of discounted like three points for them based on personnel issues for this week. So going from Josh Dobbs to Nick Mullins, um, I think that's a downgrade. I have that as about a downgrade of a point. Uh, and so we also have at uh, Fantasy Life the, our quarterback against the spread value chart. And so you could check that out there where I have everything sort of showing what the difference is between a starter and his backup. But I see uh, the benching of Dobbs for Nick Mullins is actually a downgrade for the team. Right tackle Brian O'Neill uh, dealing with an ankle injury. I don't think he's going to play this game. Right guard Ed Ingram. Uh, he exited week 14 with an, uh, a hip injury. There's no certainty he plays. Left guard Dalton Reisner, uh, he exited last week. He returned to action, and so I think he's probably going to play, but he's certainly far from 100%. As you mentioned, running back Alexander Madison uh, exited with an ankle injury. Ankle injuries for running backs normally are you know, like at least a one-week thing. He's yet to practice this week. I imagine he's out. And then Justin Jefferson... I think he's going to play, uh, you know, dealing with a yeah. chest injury. Uh, I think he's going to play, but, you know, he might not be 100%. So significant issues there. So I do see some value on Cincinnati, um, but a lot of it is driven by the injury issues going on with Minnesota. And, like, that can be hard to quantify sometimes. So any anything else that stands out in terms of line movement, some games maybe that I didn't mention. I think when we were talking earlier, you had said something about maybe uh, Denver and Detroit. Yeah, I really like where the Broncos are at at the moment. It's hard to believe. Um, you know, I couldn't imagine even saying that after, you know, week two or week three or whatever it was, they allowed 70 points. <laughs> like, they've come a long way since then. And a lot of the talk in the offseason was, was Sean Payton. Can Sean Payton fix Russell Wilson in this offense? And for me personally, I think I was a year too early on this Russell Wilson and Cortland Sutton connection as well, which has been fantastic. I mean, he's got 10 touchdowns. Russ is running again, the most rushing attempts and rushing yards per game. He's, since he's had in you know 2020 it, it's not you know early career russ where he's breaking you know 30 40 yard runs but he's doing enough in that part of the game as well and i just look at where these two teams are over the past weeks uh, past few weeks to see week seven broncos six and one plus 11 in the turnover differential 15 points per game is what this defense is allowing. Remember last year, this was an elite defense, and they only needed to score 15 points to win football games. And then since the same time span, week seven here with Detroit, they're allowing 28 points per game. They're negative eight in the turnover differential game. Goff has 12 turnovers since week seven. Seven picks. Uh, and so we got a quarterback who's been careless and a defense that's sputtering at the moment and a Broncos team that – is playing with a lot of confidence. So I, I like the plus five. I wouldn't be shocked if they went into Detroit and won this football game. And I know that Goff is back home under a dome. And if you look at his career, especially since he moved away um, from the Rams, you really started to see, especially last year, night and day when it comes to the home and away splits. But there's been a couple games at home, you know, uh, where there was the Chicago game at home. There was um, the Thanksgiving game against the Packers where he was just careless with the football. Uh, so I, I really like what I'm seeing from from Denver. Uh, it's it, I'd like to see Jerry Judy step up and and uh, catch a couple passes in the end zone instead of you know orchestrating a, a touchdown dance when he's not even in the end zone. I thought that was jokes over the weekend, but I really like where this Denver team is at. Again, playing with a lot of confidence. They're feeling like they have a shot to make the playoffs. They got a couple winnable games coming up as well. You know, they almost uh, beat Houston in Houston at the end of the game. That was another one. Russ threw the pick at the end. That would be seven, you know, wins here over the past, um, you know, few weeks. So, yeah, plus five. I know I don't think there's been a ton of line movement, but I uh, definitely feel like there's the better team at this moment, Freeman, is Denver. 
Yeah, it's moved from an open of four to five. And I know that there were uh, some betting groups that did like Detroit, and that's why it has moved out. And so, like, thinking about, you know, line movement from here, like, five is kind of a dead number. And so the question is, does this, you know, start to move towards seven, or does it move back towards three? Do you have any thoughts on the direction? I mean, this is, I feel like stuff like this, it's normally hard to predict, but like an optimal way to bet this. Do you think you maybe wait a little bit because there has been some uh, some movement in favor of Detroit? You wait a little bit and maybe this number gets to six? Uh, or do you think we might see it start to creep back towards three and it's best to get it now? Yeah, I think it's best to get it now. It's something I already put in over at FTN, the plus five. I know there's some spots at four and a half, but I, I got this feeling that it's going to come back the other way and it's going to get closer to maybe a three and a half or a four. I just view this as a field goal game. I, I, I can't... Th- I can't imagine for me personally feeling comfortable, you know, if it got to six, six and a half for, for Detroit. Uh, so I, I know it's a weird number at five, four and a half, but I, I view this as a field goal game. I'm jumping on it now. And I think that we will see this kind of move towards three and a half. And even then, like I, it's, like I said, a field goal game, I'd still take the Broncos, but you get the five, maybe it's a four point game and um, you know, you get away with it. All right, so moving on to uh, talking about spreads that are near some key numbers. Uh, Some of them mentioned earlier. You have Minnesota plus three and a half at Cincinnati. Uh, The Colts minus two and a half hosting the Steelers. Chicago plus three and a half at Cleveland. Mentioned that earlier. Atlanta minus three at Carolina. Tennessee minus two and a half hosting Houston. Uh, Tampa Bay plus three and a half at the Packers. Uh, We have mentioned this earlier. The Chiefs minus nine and a half at New England, San Francisco minus 13 and a half at Arizona, uh, the Rams minus six and a half hosting Washington. Uh, this is a game that is interesting here, just especially like the six and a half under the key number seven. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Buffalo minus <clears throat> minus two and a half hosting the Cowboys and then the Jaguars plus three and a half hosting the Ravens. Uh, you've noted in the outline here, you do like the Rams. Talk to me about this spot. Yeah, I really like where the Rams are at. Again, I'll go back to Matthew Stafford and the, the game that they had in Baltimore. I thought they were able to push the pace. There's a lot of teams that were feeling themselves at the moment they went to Baltimore. You know, I mentioned Detroit earlier. That's kind of the downfall, I suppose, of of the offense. You know, it was a tough spot. The week before they were on the road, they beat the Bucs and they went into Baltimore. And they basically were shut out until the, you know, Baltimore started putting in reserves and they got some garbage time stuff there. Um, but what Matthew Stafford has done over the last three games. I mean, he's got 10 passing touchdowns. He played Cleveland the week before, which is a good defense. I know they've sputtered lately, but 279 passing yards and three touchdowns. We had a vintage Cooper Cup game last week. Uh, Nakua has been solid all year long. And I think the biggest thing, what I've seen over the past couple of weeks is Kyron Williams, man. This guy has been really, really good uh, for the Rams before the injury. And since he returned from the injury, three games, he's got 64 attempts on the ground, over 340 rushing yards. He's got 12 12 grabs, just under 100 receiving yards and three total touchdowns. So they can run the ball and they can throw the ball. And if I look at Washington, I mean, this is you're going from what was arguably the toughest matchup in football on the road to the best matchup in football at home. I get Washington's coming off a bye. I just don't care about that. And Ron Rivera, you know, he's making excuses, firing, you know, defensive coordinator, defensive back coach, all that stuff. They just don't have the personnel. 380 yards allowed league high. 266 passing yards allowed league high, 8.1 yards per attempt, 30 points per game. Both of those league high as well. From a fantasy standpoint, the most points to quarterbacks, the second most to wide receivers, top 10 in running backs, dead last in DVOA defense and against the pass. And as I mentioned, the Rams jumped into the top 10 here in, in past DVOA. So six and a half. I could see this one moving seven, seven and a half. I really could. Uh, I, I Like I said, I really like where this Rams team is at. And they are, I mean, it's just... Yeah, Washington is playing out the schedule and you got LA hitting a groove at the right time and and playoffs are within reach for them. So the six and a half is one of my favorite bets of the week. 
I agree. Uh, I wrote that up uh, at Fantasy Life as one of my favorite bets. Put it in the bet tracker there. Uh, a number of things that you mentioned there, I agree with. The commanders coming out of the bye, theoretically, that's good for them. They should be rested and prepared, but I think there's just as good of a chance that uh, they're checked out. You know, the number 32 yeah, defense, 100%. their record is four and nine. Like, they're like mentally they're already in the postseason, you know? Yeah. So I, I don't really think they're going to be all that competitive. The Rams though, you know, they're fighting for a playoff spot at six and seven. Like you, I was really impressed with what I saw out of them last week against the Ravens. I thought the Ravens were just going to run all over them just, and I didn't think that the Rams would be able to do much on offense in part because of the defense they were facing and in part because of the weather, I thought that might make them yeah, one dimensional uh, and that would really challenge them. But I mean, the weather wasn't as bad and the Rams were, I mean, they were great. Uh, they can with Kyron Williams, who I just was not expecting to be like an actual legit NFL running back because of his size. Uh, he's, he's getting it done. Like he's uh, he's a full three down back. Uh, and that offense has looked fantastic especially since he's come back, but even, uh, you know, you just kind of look at what they've done since the week 10 by 30.25 points per game is what they're putting up. So that offense, uh, feels like it is every bit, uh, kind of the Sean McVay, Matthew Stafford offense of a couple of years ago. And the defense isn't great, but you know, defense can be variable and it's good enough. It's not terrible. Like that is, I think the key is right. that like if their defense were terrible, then they could be a real liability. But their defense is just a hair below league average, maybe even league average. And, you know, so uh, a defense that is average with an offense that can put up points, like that makes them competitive in every game and against bad opponents, I think it means that they have the right recipe to be able to steamroll them. So I agree. I have this projected on the other side of seven. And so at six and a half, I think there's value there. I would probably even bet it all the way to seven there. So we are very much on the same page. Jacksonville hosting Baltimore here. Uh, Jacksonville is plus three and a half. Uh, I think you like Baltimore in this spot. I do. Yeah, I like uh, I mean, okay. the Jags yeah. back to back losses here, Cleveland and, and Cincinnati. Um, and, you know, as much as I was giving love to uh, Jake Browning, they did lose their last two games to Jake Browning and Joe Flacco. Right. I mean, there are nine point favorites in that game um, against the Bengals and even Trevor Lawrence going down late in that game. It, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, Cincinnati was was right there in that football game. So 65 points they've allowed in their their last two losses. I thought this defense was pretty good. You know, they're still among the leaders in, in rush DVOA and stopping the run. Before two weeks ago, they were the only team that had two edge rushers with 30 plus pressures and Josh Allen and Walker. Um, so like but they've just kind of laid an egg over the past couple of weeks. And with the Jags, the second most passing yards allowed, just saw, you know, Baltimore what they've been able to do. We've talked about their defense again, surprised last week, but Trevor Lawrence, not a hundred percent. And when he's faced top defenses, this offense has struggled. San Fran. Now that was out of the bye, maybe a bad spot for them, but Cleveland KC top defenses for sure. In my opinion, they struggled overall their top 10 in yards allowed. So I have a hard time thinking that Baltimore won't score 30 points on them because other teams like, Cleveland and Cincy have over the past couple of weeks, Lamar coming off that 300 yard game, three touchdowns. So I, I just think that this may be a blowout. I think that Baltimore can get to 30 and I don't know if Jacksonville can get to 20, um, you know, missing Christian Kirk in the middle of the field. I don't think they'll have a lot of success running the football against the Ravens either. And, you know, some of these other guys inside this offense is they've struggled. You know, Zay Jones hasn't been able to stay on the field this year, and Calvin Ridley struggled with some drops. Uh, so I have some concerns where Jacksonville is at. If you asked me two weeks ago, I'd be like, oh, the Jags are in the driver's seat. Like, look at this team. They're going to win the win the conference. Uh, the, now I don't even know if they're going to win the division, right? you got Houston there kind of right behind them. So I, I like Baltimore here in this spot. Three and a half on the road. I think they win by a touchdown. Okay. I, I agree with you. Um, I agree with you so much to the point where this was three and a half it has moved to three at some places and it's Weird. actually um three minus 110 at points bet and i'm going to be betting that uh and putting that in the bet tracker because i have this projected at 3.6 and so i think getting it at uh at the key number of three there presents some value uh so yeah a uh, hundred percent agree with you there i think the jags um 
you know, their defense was propped up a little bit earlier in the season by some soft matchups, but there's really not anything special that's going on there. And then uh, their number one cornerback, Tyson Campbell, uh, he's, you know, been dealing with injuries off and on for like the past couple of months. No guarantee he's going to be playing in this game, uh, dealing with some other injuries on the defense as well. Uh, free safety, Andre Cisco, uh, he's been injured. Uh, so, you know, there's that on the defensive side of the ball. And then on offense, you know, like that's kind of obvious, like they're down to like their third string left tackle, uh, yeah. you know, obviously quarterback issues, Christian Kirk being injured. Um, yeah, I think it's, it is pretty easy to be bullish on the, uh, on the Ravens in this spot. Uh, any other key numbers here or not key numbers, but you know, near key numbers that stand out to you in terms of like, okay, if you like, you know, if you like the Colts, for instance, minus two and a half, you should be betting that now, you know, before it gets to three or, you know, in case it gets to three or anything like that with any of these other games here. Yeah, I, I could get behind that Colts one, especially with TJ Watt banged up. He's in concussion protocol. And again, uh, a Steelers team, they can't beat anybody good. They can't beat anybody bad. Um, Like got to be one of the worst teams of the past few years, you know, at this point of the season to have seven W's, you know, back to back losses against Arizona and New England. Those teams were eight games below 500 when they played them and they played them at home. Uh, no real excuse. I mean, now they got to go to Trubisky and say what you want about Kenny Pickett. But this is like a downgrade. I, you know, you went from Dubs to Mullins. You talk about that being a downgrade. I think that this is a downgrade as well. Um, so I, I the Colts are a hard team to back because Gardner Minshew is so crazy with the football. He's you know, fumbles and turnovers. He does great things and then awful things. And then, you know, the defense has given up some big time plays through the air. But can you like say with confidence that Trubisky is going to be able to take advantage of that? I, I just don't see it. So I also don't see that one moving to three and a half or four. But if what was ruled out, maybe, maybe that gets it to, to three and a half. But right now, Indy minus three and Love to get your thoughts on the on the Buffalo and, and Dallas game too on on the total of that one. One of my favorite bets inside that game is uh, over at Bet three six five. Both teams have scored twenty plus points is plus one twenty five. You know the Cowboys at seven and zero at home, averaging nearly forty points per game at home and three and three on the road. Mention Arizona, that's a team that they lost to on the road, uh, one and two in outdoor games. And the Bills on the flip side, you know five and one at home only allowing 14 points per game. I think you would agree if this game was in Dallas, they'd probably be five and a half, six point favorites here. Uh, Buffalo is a true, both of these teams have a, a true home field advantage and the Bills, you know, similar record to the Steelers, not even close when it comes to talent on and, and skill on both sides of the football. Buffalo is a much better team here than, than Pittsburgh. So I'm interested to see, get your take on, on that game. I kind of have a lean to the over and some points being scored. You know, I am much more interested in the the spread for Dallas and Buffalo than the total. I have it projected like very close to 50 and a half. So like I'm in line with the market there. I can see the case for points being scored and I can also see the point the case for points like not being scored with like hey, it's the Cowboys on the road playing uh in New York in December. You know, like you could you could yep. see how their offense wouldn't operate at full functionality in that type of environment. So I can I can see the case for both. I'm probably staying away from that. But, you know, like if you like Buffalo, you know, this number at two and a half, like I doubt it would actually get to three. But, you know, like the difference from two and a half to like one and a half or one is pretty negligible. And the difference from two and a half to three is massive if you like the bills. So I think if you like the bills, you probably be best served in like betting them now, just in case yeah. this gets to three. But I actually do like the Cowboys in this spot. Uh, I have this projected at one and just in terms of like pure power ratings, uh, I have the Cowboys ahead of the bills. I have the Cowboys as the number uh, two team you know, behind only the 49ers. Uh, and so if this were on a neutral, you know, I think obviously the Cowboys should be favored in that situation. But I think the Bills, especially, you know, given the environment, have like a real home field advantage uh, and, you know, a home field advantage that is maximized by the fact that 
you know, the Cowboys play in a dome. The Cowboys are not in their division. Like there's a home field advantage, like in division and then out of division and home field Absolutely. advantage out of division is, is even higher. And so, you know, just, I think a real home field advantage in this spot, you have the Cowboys, you know, coming off of like, I won't say this is like a letdown spot because like both of these teams are coming off of big wins and, you know, like they both, they're both highly motivated to be playing in this game. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think it's just a tougher spot for Dallas here, but you know, I still, I I'm still showing value here on the Cowboys. I have this at plus one. So I would say like this kind of gets us into the, the teaser conversation here. I think it's a pretty decent week for teasers, you know, like ideally you're moving through two key numbers. You know, if you can get through three and get through seven with teasers, that's a really great way to do that. And with the Cowboys, we have that, like this number sitting here at two and a half, even if it moves to one and a half, we're getting through the key numbers of three and seven. So the Cowboys are very much uh, in my consciousness as a teaser option here. I've already teased them this week. Other teaser potential teams that we uh, have talked about already, the Steelers plus two and a half at Indianapolis. Uh, I think this has moved to three at some books, but is available at two and a half at other books. Uh, the Dolphins uh, minus eight and a half that can be teased down to two and a half uh, hosting the Jets. And then we have the uh, the Texans here plus two and a half on the road at Tennessee that can be teased up to eight and a half. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Cowboys as you know a potential teaser leg and then any of those other options really stand out to you? I actually like all these, maybe, maybe not so much the Steelers, but at the same time, I don't feel like the Colts will blow anybody out or the defense is, is good enough. If there's what get pressure on Minshew, you know, I could, you could tease that one up, but I really like the Cowboys. I don't feel like either team is going to blow out. There's not going to be blowout on either side. I think it's going to be a tight football game, really close coming down. And that's the way the bills have played all year. Really. I know that the Cowboys have blown out a, a lot of mediocre teams and some decent ones as well. Eagles a couple weeks ago or just last week rather. Uh, but this is a, you could tease that one up maybe to like seven and a half. Right. And that's, I feel like it's going to be inside a touchdown and the Miami one makes a lot of sense as well. I was really surprised to see Miami's defense fold last week because I was talking about them kind of finding their groove. The first few weeks of the season, they were among the leaders in, in passing yards allowed. And, and that made a lot of sense because they were just scoring so many points and teams were chucking all over them. But then when Jalen Ramsey returned to the lineup, I thought that their, their secondary was taking shape with Ramsey and Xavier and Howard and, and Ramsey was creating some turnovers. But the fact that they allowed two touchdowns at home in the final four or five minutes of that game against the Titans and Will Levis and, and really just, you know, needed just focus on just one player in Hopkins. I know Tajay Spirits has some nice moments down the stretch, but on the other side, the Jets, you know, they're not getting anything from Brees Hall. He's just really turning into a pass catching running back at this moment. Garrett Wilson is doing some decent things and went back to Zach Wilson teasing Miami down to win this game by a field goal, uh, I think makes some sense. And if you, you know, I guess if we see Tyree kill, how, how much does this number move? If we hear Thursday or Friday that Tyree kill is, is practicing in full, right? Does it, does it jump back up and then you don't get that two and a half or the three and a half. Uh, so I, I like actually all of these spots. Cause I don't think the Titans can blow out anybody either, right? This is a team that is, they either get blown out or they hang around in a, in a field goal game and they're able to lean on Derrick Henry uh, but the Texans right now, wondering about Nico Collins. They lost Tank Dell. Tennessee is still somewhat decent uh, against the run. Texans don't even really want to run the football. <laughs> they have C.J. Stroud dropping back and checking the ball so much. Is Dalton Schultz returned? So there's a lot of question marks I have right now with this Texans offense. But if some of their players, if Nico Collins is good, Dalton Schultz is good, you know that's one that I can I could certainly tease up and you know getting getting them at plus seven and a half or plus eight or something like that against the Titans I think makes a lot of sense. So what I like about the Texans in this spot is that you know whether they're going with Davis Mills who like he's an obvious downgrade there's no question but like yeah. he's at least like an NFL quarterback right like he has 26 starts in his career 6.1 adjusted yards per attempt for his career like. That's not great, but it's livable. You know, like he's an experienced NFL quarterback. So whether they go with him or they go with Case Keenum, like they at least have a backup who like belongs in the NFL or like has legitimate NFL experience. Um, so I feel like 
we're priced near the worst case scenario, or at least in my projections, I'm you know taking the worst case scenario into account as like the baseline, like that is what I'm assuming. And so uh, given that, I think there's some value here uh, in teasing Houston up because this, this number could get a lot better if uh, I don't think CJ Stroud returns, but you know, like guys have cleared the concussion protocol pretty quickly yep. over the past yep. six weeks. Uh, Nico Collins, you know, potentially he returns, but you know, there are a number of guys who are out for uh, or assumed out for the Texans in my projections. And so if any of them comes back, you know, that just gives a little bit of boost to the Texans in this spot here. So uh, even if CJ Stroud is out, I think there's probably some value here in the two and a half teasing it up to eight and a half. Um, the Jets. I'm interested in any thoughts you might have on like this this specific matchup because if Tyree Kill were fully healthy, and that's you know kind of what the assumption was when I bet this on the look ahead, you know like Tyree Kill healthy, I thought okay yes going against a tough defense, but a defense that doesn't get any offensive support, and a defense right. that can still be beat by really fast wide receivers because the, the jets have physical press corners. Uh, and most of the time they can hang with guys, but they could be beat by really fast wide receivers. You know, like if Tyree kill is able to get by the guy defending him, he's gone. Uh, and so like that, like the specifics of the matchup really intrigued me, but now you have injuries to Tyreek. You know, and you have an offense that for the Jets maybe is a little bit more competent and can help support the defense a little bit more. So any thoughts just kind of diving into that matchup just a little bit more with the Dolphins and the Jets? Yeah, I you know, when these two teams played each other just a couple weeks ago, I, it was the lowest I had seen a Tyree Kill prop. It was like 73 and a half, and he basically did it on the on the opening drive. Um you know, I, even without him, I think that they would be fine because of what they can bring to the table, not just the speedy wide receivers that they have, like, you know, obviously Jalen Waddle, but the two running backs. I mean, the Jets are inside the top five and rushing yards allowed uh, in games that they have won. I think teams have kind of, you know, credit to their defense, but I think teams have kind of tripped up and they threw the ball more than they should have. You know, the Eagles do come to mind. Jalen Hurts dropping back and and chucking a whole lot on that defense is not what you really want. But you got a play caller, Mike McDaniel, who can create some things, uh, you know, guys in motion, which can uh, create havoc for the secondary. But I just think like Raheem Mostert and Devonta Chan, if you just lean on those two guys, they still should be able to to put up points against this defense, run the football. And I think Tyreek's going to be fine as well. The fact that he was able to come back in that game, and I know it was – it wasn't full go. There were some moments when they needed some points. He wasn't on the field, but he was still getting in there. Running motion looked fine. Running motion makes me think that this is something that he could battle through in a scenario where they, they do need to win the football game. It looks like they're going to make the playoffs, but you know, a couple wins by, by Buffalo and a couple of losses by Miami. And then that week 18 game when those two teams play each other could potentially be for the division. So again, I, I think maybe last week was a slight outlier for the secondary. I, I think that the defense has played pretty decent. Certainly the Jets have the the advantage in the secondary. I think that they could use both of these running backs, uh, create some avenues with some motion and just really lean on the ground game and do enough maybe to, to win this game by double digit points and maybe get your, your early spread. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm already writing that off as a loss. Uh horrific <laughs> bet there. Uh all right. So anything to to close this out stand out to you as a like a you know kind of quote unquote favorite bet or a best bet uh right now on the board. I know that we talked earlier about uh the Rams, uh the Ravens, uh maybe one of those as a favorite or anything else that we haven't talked about so far. Yeah, I'd like to give you something new. Um, you know, if you told me that uh, Geno Smith was going to start, I would jump on the the plus four for the the Seattle Seahawks against the Philadelphia Eagles. But just, you know, with the injury that happened towards the end of last week, 
groin injury, not practicing again today. So we'll see what happens. I see some three and a halves the, in some spots. But if it, if it is Geno Smith, maybe that's something that you wait out. You hear the Geno news. He's good to go. How much does that line change? Probably not a whole lot. I'd say the Eagles maybe three-point favorites on the road. Uh, I do believe that they're the largest road uh, favorite on the board here at the moment. We'll see if Baltimore does move to four, four and a half. But I would say Geno, if he does suit up, you know, they, I thought they played pretty good against the Cowboys a, a couple weeks ago, scoring some points. And the Eagles are, are definitely going through something at the moment defensively and offensively in last week and, and three turnovers, uh, two of them inside the red zone. But I just go back to Baltimore. You know, you mentioned the three at points bet. I think that's a really good p- uh, pick. Uh, and the Rams at six and a half. And by the way, I am, as, as we're talking out, I am seeing more line movement. I don't even think there's a five available now um, for the Denver Broncos. I'm seeing fours across the board, plus four, three, six, five, DraftKings, FanDuel, BetMGM, Caesars, and Bet Rivers all around a similar price at minus 109. So maybe that is what we talked about earlier, jumping in. Maybe that is something that, you know, kind of favors the Broncos. Maybe it gets to three, three and a half. So if you can get that four, I still like the four. I, st- I think it's a field goal game. You get the Broncos there at plus four, plus four and a half. I uh, would jump on that. Yeah. I mean, the move from five to four is, uh, you know, fairly insignificant, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, so like you're not losing any value by kind of waiting to see right. which direction the market is moving, but you have that information of knowing the market is bullish in this direction. And I, I think that information is, is worthwhile to have, uh, a couple of games that stand out. Um, 49ers they are the largest road favorite 13 and a half gotcha. playing the Cardinals and oh, I yeah. uh, disgustingly I actually do think that there's a little bit of value there but this is I will say nothing to do with projections it is a hundred percent vibes which that it's not the way I generally like to make my bets but I do I do see value there um and I will just say like I think it it's hard for me to get in my uh my power ratings the 49ers high enough to where right. uh i'm i'm matching the market um but you know you just kind of look at what they're doing and by the way i'll say like i said before i still have them number one easily in my power ratings it's just you know i'm i have them at like 8.25 better than uh an average team on neutral uh and predictable they're 8.9 and the espn football power index they're 10.9 uh, and I think they were even a little bit higher than that last week in Massey Peabody. And that number just might continue to go up. So like, I think even though I am very optimistic about the 49ers, I'm just a little bit too low on them in my power ratings. But, you know, with Brock Purdy, you know, he's number one in adjusted yards per attempt, number one in composite EPA uh, and completion percentage over expectation, number one in ESPN's QBR, you know, like with Purdy at quarterback, that offense is highly functional. And the Cardinals are in a decent situational spot. They're at home off of the bye. Uh, the 49ers are playing their second consecutive divisional game, their third road game in four weeks. Uh, Kyler Murray is 23-13-2 against the spread for his career as an underdog. So all of that situationally is good for the Cardinals, but I just, I don't care. Uh, the 49ers yeah. beat the Cardinals 35-16 to in week four. That was when the Cardinals were still trying to win. Like now they have Kyler Murray, but they also you know have just a month left. And it might be kind of what we talked about with the commanders earlier. Like those guys could already be checked out. You know, like they're coming off of the bye with just a month left as one of the worst teams in football going against the best team in football, a team that controls its destiny for the number one seed and is highly motivated we could see the Cardinals have a very half-hearted effort in this spot. And the 49ers and their 10 wins, they've just been blowing team, teams out. They have a 19.6 point differential in their wins. So 49ers, you know, 13 and a half. We hadn't really talked about that game yet, but man, I know it's so stupid. It is so stupid to say, hey, I like the 49ers at 13 and a half, but like I still I still like them in that spot. Like yeah. I think they win by 14. Um yeah, and then, I, would agree, I would agree with you, Friedman. Yeah. I would I mean go go ahead. Yeah. I was just jump in there and just give some love to Purdy. I mean, what he's doing, the team's gonna score 30 points. And if you think Arizona's yeah. can get to 20, I don't. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and then one more game here uh, that is another favorite of mine early in the week. Bears plus three and a half at the Browns. So this is kind of floating between three, three and a half in the market. Obviously, like it much more at the three and a half. Two big factors for me are driving this bet. The first is the Bears defense. But it was uh, like ravaged by injuries early in the year, especially in the secondary. But since week six, that's when their number one quarterback, Jalen Johnson, returned to the lineup. The Bears are number five in defensive EPA. Like the Bears have an underappreciated and legitimately good defense. Uh, So that's one factor. Uh, I think the market just isn't fully pricing in the Bears defense. And then the second factor is health. The Bears are almost entirely healthy. I believe I was looking at this and I I couldn't find it. I think the bears don't have one single player on IR right now. Like they are just kind of uncommonly healthy at this point of the year. The only player who they have on the injury report, I believe right now is Equinemia St. Brown, who's like kind of like barely a starter and not really an important starter for them. So like they are healthy. Uh, And then you compare that to, uh, to the Browns who are without their two starting offensive tackles, without their swing offensive tackle. So they're down to their you know number four, number five tackles on the offensive line with Joe Flacco back there. Terrible situation. They might be without their starting center. They're obviously without Nick Chubb. They might be without his backup uh, on defense. They are already without their number three safety. He's on IR. This past week, they lost their starting safety and free starting starting strong safety and free safety uh, to injuries. Uh, like maybe those guys return this week, but no guarantee that they return this week. And they could be without two defensive tackles. Uh, and then of course, you know, like they're on their number four quarterback. Now, like Joe Flacco, obviously better than your typical number four quarterback. I would say like they sort of lucked into Flacco maybe being the exact right guy that they needed uh, in the the post, you know, Watson era for this season. But, uh, you know, still not a great situation that they've had to like meander their way to Flacco uh, versus just having a competent backup to start the year. So a really negative injury situation for the Browns. Uh, and that puts me on the Bears in this spot. So I have this projected at 1.8. Uh, and so to be able to get it at three, three and a half, I think that there is value there. Uh, Meanie, any thoughts on this game here with the Browns and the Bears? I mean, a long list of injuries for Cleveland is remarkable. Uh, I did not know that there wasn't one bear on IR, and I think you're right about St. Brown. I mean, I think you you gave him a little bit more love there. I don't believe he is a starter in the NFL, but I, I want to just preference what you said about the Bears' defense. I, the defense has been great. The stuff rate has been among the leaders. In terms of yards allowed per carry, they're among the leaders as well. Third fewest, second fewest rushing yards allowed. They're in the top 10 in, in rush DVOA defense as well over at FTN. So I I think it kind of, they made a lot of moves in the offseason to get some pieces, right? They didn't really have a whole lot on the defensive side. So they've made made some moves in the offseason, like Edwards is a guy that I like. And then getting sweat from um, Washington yeah. has really kind of shored up their rush defense, getting some pressure on the quarterback. Justin Fields has had some really nice moments. DJ Moore has had a great season. Just a, the, the slip up in the middle of the season was without – Justin Fields there as well. Cole Komet's had some moments. Deontay Foreman came back last week and took control of the backfield. I thought he looked good when he was filling in for Khalil Herbert. Uh, and we didn't really see anything from Rashawn Johnson last week. I like the call. I like the call as uh, a lot. And I think it's just one defense that I really respected in Cleveland. Now all the injuries have piled up and the other defense is kind of just underrated. So, yeah, that's probably the... Maybe Vegas not giving enough credit to uh, Chicago and what they've done lately, uh, especially being able to stop the the ground game. Yeah, you mentioned DJ Moore. I just absolutely love him, especially like you know from the fantasy perspective. For years, I feel like he's been undervalued, uh, and then now, you know, with Chicago in the eight full games that he's had with Justin Fields, he has eight hundred and twenty nine yards and eight touchdowns. Uh, you know, when you're combining. Amazing what he's done as a receiver with, you know, a little bit of the rushing production he's had on the ground. Uh, So just absolutely fantastic production out of DJ Moore. Hopefully they can keep that going. And it it will be curious to see, uh, you know, how the the Browns or how the Bears rather finish the year, uh, how Justin Fields does and how that might impact what they do in the draft, because they have that number one pick of the Panthers 
it looks like it's going to be the number one pick and not just uh, you know a, a run of the mill first rounder. And so they will have a shot to take a quarterback at number one if they want to. Uh, you know, will they do it uh, or will they, you know, roll back with Justin Fields again? So uh, it'll be, you know, very interesting in this game and for the rest of the season to, to really see how the Bears do. Uh, and, you know, hopefully they can end on a little bit of run. And uh, yeah. you know, I don't know, like that NFC North is that's an intriguing, uh, intriguing division, uh, you know, in the post Aaron Rodgers era. It would be cool to see, uh, you know, some other teams really kind of rise up and uh, end up be able to take advantage there. So, all right, Mini, uh, awesome having you on the show. Give us the the plug. What uh, what is going on with your work? Uh, where can people find it? Everything you guys have going on at FTN, etc. Yeah, appreciate it, uh, Freeman. This has been a blast, man. Uh, at Chris Meany on Twitter, on the X machine, always tweeting uh, some of my shows and, and my content. Uh, you know, of course, Mean Streets is a sh- multi-sport show. I say, of course, but it is a multi-sport show. <laughs> People may not know that. I uh, talk a little football and I'm a big hockey fan as well. We're diving into NBA. So we're covering a lot of things uh, on Mean Streets. We have Dangle Bat Selly, which is a a hockey show with my guy Eric Young as well. Uh, you may know him from In the Ring, but he's also a big football guy and a big NHL guy. So we're talking some fantasy hockey from a betting standpoint and a DFS standpoint. But yeah, all my content, all the picks, you know, a, a lot of them are, are free on of our FTN Network YouTube page. But over at uh, FTNBets.com, we have the NFL betting model and some picks uh, that we chuck in there as well uh, for myself included and all the all the sports that I, I do cover. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Appreciate you having me on here. It's been a minute since you and I have chopped it up. And, uh, yeah, we basically covered every game and there's uh, a couple ugly games. So appreciate the invite, dude, and uh, keep going strong here, man. Yeah, and by the way, I want to give a shout out to, uh, to Mean Streets. Uh, when you say like a multi-sport show. You, I think, are one of the best, like, kind of sports generalist that I know. You know, like, uh, I have enough trouble sucking at the NFL. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, when it comes to, to sports oh, betting, um, like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine adding some other sports on top of that. But you know, like, you're really strong NFL better, and then you're awesome at NHL. You know, and then of course you've got other sports layered on top of that. You're you're good at baseball, good at basketball. So like like honestly, like I I can't imagine trying to do what you are doing with covering all of the sports. So like uh, a hat tip to you on that uh, to be you. able to Thank to you. cover those other sports and to cover them well. You know, so it's uh it's like it's one thing and then it's another thing entirely. So uh, hats off to you. Keep on crushing with that. All right, that is going to do it for, let's see, the week 15, week 15 already, my goodness, the week 15 overview edition of the Betting Life podcast, powered by Unabated. Please subscribe to the show, tell your degenerate betting friends, join the Discord, see all of our bets in the 100% free Fantasy Life Bet Tracker, and follow us on social media at Chris Meany and Matt F. The Oracle. Thank you and see you again next episode.